Good morning and welcome to a very chilly sunrise safari. We're not going to be seeing much of the sun, I don't think. I think this is the coldest I've been in quite some time. I've got a blankie on, I've got two jerseys on, and I haven't even broken out my winter kit yet, so I'm regretting that slightly. But it is a very cloudy day. Uh, my name is Brent Yo Smith. I have Vim, aka the Wildebeest Dornbank on camera. We have Jamie and jean -Dre out on the other vehicle, and we have Geraldine and Louise in final control. So, really, really windy night last night, so good if you were a cat, and it continues to be good hunting weather if you're a cat with these dark skies and bustly winds. So, Liam and I are heading towards the last position of those Birmingham male lions to see how much of that buffalo they've managed to inhale overnight. There was a report of three lioness on the Arethusa camp crossing the dam wall. I wonder if they went to join the Birmingham boys, and that was from Diane. So we will see shortly. We're not too far away. But it is a very chilly morning. Now, a chilly, cold morning with this strong wind is going to make it very difficult to see lots of the general game. Oh, scrub here. Off you go. Uh, Anne-Marie says she can't believe that this wind is still whipping around. It is. It seems to have brought a large cold front. And how long it will stay, we shall find out. Not sure that this does look quite dark and ominous up there, but you won't be able to see it just yet. I think we might be in for a bit of rain later. We shall see as the safari progresses. Now, a lot of our long-time viewers will know that I am not a fan of the cold. So Sue says, what's happening? Where's Brent rushing off to? Well, so I'm not, not rushing per se, just driving with hunched shoulders and shivering my way towards the Birmingham males uh, to see if they're still there or whether they've inhaled that whole buffalo carcass. Now here will be a good spot to, look, to see if their tracks have already departed from that buffalo, but it doesn't look like it. The Birminghams have quite a habit of leaving a half-finished buffalo lying around. But I think they were particularly hungry this time, so maybe they will finish this whole one. It'll be very interesting to see if those three lionesses, and exactly who those three lionesses might be. Three lionesses together, there's a strong possibility it could be the Styx ladies. So while we continue and to make our way towards what's left of that buffalo, uh, let's go to Jamie so she can bid you a good morning. Good morning and welcome to our sunrise safari. If of course we do have any kind of sunrise, it seems a little bit unlikely at this point. I think it's more that it's just going to get lighter as the day progresses. I know that Brent's spoken to you a lot about this peculiar weather we've been experiencing. I'd like to say, I'm sure you'll all agree that perhaps I should stop trying to predict what the weather's going to do, because so far I don't think I've been right once. So much for the rain that I thought was going to come bucketing down out of the sky this morning. Now Brent's on his way towards Arethusa to check up on the Birmingham boys and their kill, possibly follow up on the report of those lines on seen on the Arethusa dam camera. I'm going to stick around Juma, see if the Mkuhuma is still or not that was different lionesses that wandered through there. They had their tracks yesterday going in to close to the drainage line or the creek system to the Boyatella Dam. Then nothing came out, out. They then got a very garbled message that the Birmingham boys' buffalo kill was actually killed by the Mkuhumas and that they'd been chased off by the Birmingham boys. 
And when I asked more about that, they said that absolutely wasn't the case. There was the situation where the Birmingham or the Majingis, Majingilan male lions, chased the Inkahumas off a zebra kill in Simbambini. So maybe that's where the stories got crossed or the lions got crossed. Haha, <laughs> the lions got crossed. Haha. <laughs> we'll wait and see. <laughs> Comic genius very, very early in the morning. Uh, I'm going to check all the way around here. Karula's definitely been around this, around Juma. Brent had her tracks yesterday wandering up and down all over the show, so we'll check for her. We'll also keep an eye out for them. But in the meantime, I'm going to wait until it's a bit lighter and just pop my head in at the hyena den. I have to confess, I don't think that the hyenas are going to be up this morning. I think they're going to be taking full advantage of this very pleasant weather that is more appropriate for cuddling up in bed. That's what they're going to be doing, tucked away in their little holes. It's not just because it's cold out here, and it is cold for us. <laughs> this was positively Arctic for us. They will also, because of all of the wind, it's very dangerous for the cubs to be out and about in this kind of... ...dark, though for us to head there. So we're going to check along Sydney's Dam. I'm checking very carefully for tracks on this road. And the lions very frequently use it as a highway between Buffles Hook, Arethusa, Ari Gate, and then into the corner of Juma there. I don't think I should go any further down this hill without our signal. I don't think I can without our signal disappearing. There's a little bit of, can be a bit of a black hole. Um, but I haven't seen any tracks coming. It's okay. We'll just go straight towards Aubrey's Road. Linda, I am absolutely frozen to the bone. We had a discussion this morning about whether or not it was still shorts weather, whether we could still get away with our standard summer uniform of shorts and a shirt and decided that absolutely it was shorts weather. It'd be totally fine. No. No, this is long trouser weather. This is shorts weather. About. I'm definitely not a cold weather person. I much prefer to be too hot. Turn back later. We'll go search for the Inkahuma tracks instead. Try and see if we can't piece together the story of exactly their what their movements have been over the last. As far as I know, the last time we saw them was a couple of days ago, and they were looking distinctly hungry. I'm sure that they've fed since. We know that they had that zebra kill. I'm not sure how much they managed to eat of that before. Oh, no. Before the Majingi lion males chased them off. I'm sure we're all, I know we're all very keen to see how they're doing. That's interesting. So Good morning, Reese. Welcome to our sunrise safari. Reese wants to know how far the Juma camera is from Arethusa, since it seems to be stormy on Juma, but not on Arethusa a little bit earlier. It's interesting. I would have thought that this prevailing wind condition would be fairly universal across the northern Slavi sands. To give you a rough distance, it's probably about five kilometers, give or take maybe a little bit less, no, about five kilometers in a straight line, five or six, which equates to somewhere in the region of two and a half odd miles, two to two and a half odd miles away. So not terribly far in a straight line, a little bit longer to drive. Nevertheless, it's interesting that you observed that, Reese. I can only speak from our side to say that it was definitely very windy and very stormy. Just Use my spotlight very carefully. I don't think anybody's home at the hyena den. 
As you know, we don't like to spotlight the little cubs, and it's still a bit dark. So we'll leave them be for now. Seems as though I was right. They are safely ensconced in their beds, or they've moved, which is also a possibility, because the last few times I've visited this den, they haven't been about. Brenda, on the subject of little animals and the pitter-patter of tidy feet, Brenda wants to know if we have any updates on the Styx lionesses and whether or not they've given birth yet. Brenda, from what we know, no, not as of yesterday, when they were seen around Nkoro Cheetah Plains area, all three of them together, when the first one to give birth goes missing, so when the, when the guides start calling in a sighting of two females rather than three, that's when we can start to guess at the fact that she's, headed, she's gone off on her own to give birth. Lionesses, of course, prefer the solitude of such events and they'll go off, find a nice thick area in a drainage line or around a nice denning site and they'll be on their own there for roughly six weeks depending on whether or not there's other females with young cubs. So we can guess at, if one of them starts to move away from the rest of the pride, we can maybe guess that she's had little ones. Brenda, I'm not sure how far along she is. As we said earlier, it's very difficult, and none of us are experts on exactly when or how far along, how to judge a pregnancy of a lion. And just a quick update on the subject of cubs and their arrival. Shadow was seen yesterday with one cub. I think, as far as I know, it's she has one cub. And she is safe and sound and around Arethusa. So she has been seen. Obviously, we're giving her plenty of space since those cubs are younger, as far as we know, than Karula's cubs. But she has managed so far to keep her little one with her. And a nice update on that side of things as well. Oh, from speaking about tiny little animals from different cubs, seems as though Brent has arrived at the buffalo carcass with some of our largest lions in the area. So we've arrived at the remnants of that buffalo carcass and I've only seen three males so far. And as you can see, there's a fat belly. The carcass is in the bush there. We will move around, see if we can get a better view. But there we go. You can see still quite a bit of the carcass left. And uh, I think they're still going to be here for the sunset safari. Oh, there we go. So they've placed it in this little thicket here to stop creatures like vultures spotting it and also to have a nice shady place to feed. Oh, there we go. Pull it out. That's a good boy. Pull it better to where we can see it better. You can see getting stuck into that and after that hot day yesterday and very humid day. The carcass is probably quite putrid already, but that's never stopped the lion. Lions are quite happy to feed off very rotting meat. how powerful they are. I saw a slight limp as this guy got up. I wonder if it's the same one we had near Buffalo's Hook water hole a few safaris ago. Try have a look at the other males. They're sleeping off on the other side of this little creek bed. So I only saw three when we came. Doesn't mean all five aren't present. I 
see the flies buzzing around already. And you'll probably find there's been a lot of eggs laid in that carcass. So that's four now, I think. Just over there. There's a car coming through, so I won't show it too long. Morning, morning. Siberia is joking, says, does buffalo breakfast go good with eggs, toast, and bacon? Well, I think the only bacon these lines have ever had is warthog. So I think they either have one or the other. So this morning, it's buffalo. Unfortunately, he is right in that little thicket. I'm trying to see if I can maybe just move forward a centimetre or two, see if we can see a little bit more. Wicked Ang would like to know, is that the thin one we saw yesterday? I'm not sure. I don't think so, though. So, I don't think it is one, but there are quite a few fat lions lying about. Can you get a shot of that guy through the bush there, Ben? See him? Just go up. And a little bit to the right. Just come out a little bit. He might just be behind that baby lead or leadwood for you. He's about there. Come down to the ground, now slightly to the left. And so there is a line behind there. You're just going to have to trust me for now until we can move. Oh, he's getting really stuck in now. Listen to that. See how he turns his head to the side? Using his premolars as a, basically like a massive pair of side cutters. And you can hear a virtual starling calling in the tree above. So the dawn chorus will be very quiet on a morning like this. And you can see how the flesh is, is starting to rot already. You can actually smell it. Oh, it looks like he might pull the carcass again. Come. So Virginia and Kentucky is asking when coalition members fight, have they ever been known to kill one another? So Virginia, it is possible, and I'm trying to remember, I have heard of it on one or two occasions, but normally it doesn't go that far. It can be quite violent. They do often beat each other up quite badly. But it's very unusual they'll actually kill each other.
Rich would like to know, do lions still contract bovine tuberculosis from eating buffalo in the Sabi sands and then it mutates into feline TB? Uh, it, they do, it is possible, Rich, but there's some, oh, look at this. He might try to pull it again, no. He's got his spot. There's a lot of recent studies in Kruger uh, by the scientists that are showing a, a strong immunity towards the tuberculosis, even though the lions are carrying it. It doesn't really affect them like it did when the disease made its initial uh, jump over. So yes, they are still carriers, but it has very little effect on them unless they have already a predisposed uh, genetic de defect or disorder. So there has been almost zero change in the li uh, longevity of, of lions uh, to do with the TV, even though they are, carri they are carriers now. Now, very interesting. Uh, bovine tuberculosis in the south of the Kruger Park is about 35 to 40 percent. And the further you move north in the park, the less bovine tuberculosis there is. So right up in the northern sectors of the park in Pafuri, uh, there's only about 6 percent of the buffalo have bovine tuberculosis, which is very different from the southern end of the park where between 35 and 40 percent of the buffalo are carriers of bovine tuberculosis. So Clayton says he's got a big bite. Uh, he says he knows that hyenas have got the strongest. How strong is a lion? Well, Clayton, if I remember correctly, I might be wrong, so you guys are more than welcome to double check for me. But if I remember correctly, a lion's bite is somewhere between 400 and 600 pounds of pressure per square inch. Although the number 800 does somehow sit in my brain. But uh, I wouldn't mind if you guys would check for me uh, how many pounds of pressure per square inch is a lion's bite. And you can send those answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag safarilive on Twitter. We'll sit here with these lines a little bit longer, uh, but in the meantime, let's go to Jamie, who's got some of the creatures that lions eat. Some rather nervous antelope and zebra on quarantine clearings. Definitely looking a little bit stressed out. After that windy, dark night, you can, can barely blame them. Bear with me one moment, I'm gonna give the guys an update. Morning, no updates for Vuotilla so far, just Shamin Love around Philemon's cut line. Hello guys. We had a scary night. Zebra already moving away from us. The last we knew they'd moved a little bit further to the north um, on the same side of the road but very close to the fire break. Uh, you'll see it from the road. I checked earlier, it wasn't active. <laughs> They're all puffed up. Impala actually almost change colour on a cold day like today. They get, their hair stands on end, just like we get goosebumps or chicken skin. And it gives them a much darker red colour than their usual glossy sheen. Tails all swishing, very fluffed. Even their tails are fluffed up this morning. Shame little ones. Probably the coldest they've ever experienced little male with his first horns, or his horns first coming through. I've seen two of these young males actually headbutting each other. Whoop. I wish I could jump like that. Though they've already started to be affected by the hormones that are flying around at the moment. 
trying to fight each other with those tiny little dagger-like horns. It's quite sweet to watch, actually. Let's try and get to another view of those zebra. I have a sneaky suspicion about those hyena, just by the way. I have a sneaky suspicion that they've moved. Oopsie. Sorry, Wendy. <laughs> Clayton. No, unfortunately, our Land Rovers don't have heaters. Um, that's definitely not. We have a lot of a lot of things in our Land Rovers. Lots of radios, microphone boxes, cables, um, rain covers, all kinds of different items. None of those include a heater. The best approach in midwinter, and midwinter does here does get exceptionally cold. Just look how grouped together and nervous these zebra are. Oh, sorry, Clayton. I'll be with you in one sec. Unhappy bunch. Look at that. It's actually a bachelor herd. A very large bachelor herd. They were probably about eight or nine there. This must be the same herd that James mentioned to me. So no, no heaters. The best you could do is wrap yourself in a blanket and grab a hot water bottle on our freezing winter days. We're not quite at that stage just yet, but I feel as though I'm sort of several temp not not too far off it. Brent's reposition for the lions. I have other things to find you. And our general game's a bit nervous, so why don't you go and have a look at some more Birmingham boys? So we've jumped across to have a look at some of the other lions around. And you can see fat bellies. It is quite difficult to ID the different individuals while we're here. But isn't that a wonderful view of the bottom of a male lion's paw? You can see the very distinct little three lobes there. And distended belly. So there's a second of the males. And if we go up above him, and go, you can see the other two sleeping. That looks like the skinny guy. But he is looking a lot better now. You can see his belly is quite round. And there's another fat belly in the thicket. And there's number five. Thank you to Eileen, Curtis, and Judy. Uh, lions have a bite force of 600 pounds of pressure per square inch. Uh, hyenas are almost double that at 1,100 pounds of pressure per square inch. And so this male's obviously been feeding recently, and he's now giving himself a good clean. So we're just going to move slightly so we can maybe try to catch his whole head. Do lions or other animals ever get cavities or abscesses in their teeth? Most definitely lions, leopards, hyenas, probably more so than other animals because they do utilize their teeth a lot. And of course, chewing on bones and catching creatures, you know, to break a tooth or two. So they do get cavities and abscesses quite frequently. And it's sometimes quite visible and you will find quite a few of them with broken teeth as well. And you can see he was probably feeding just before we arrived. Uh, his face still quite moist with buffalo juices. But looks like he's eaten a lot, almost ready to flop. Isn't that beautiful?
So a big and warm safari alive. Good morning to Tiffany, who is Sinead's sister. Sinead is a guide at Incoro, who used to be an avid viewer. So lovely to have you with us, Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany would like to know, are these the same lions that I saw with Sinead when I was visiting at Incoro? They are, Tiffany. This is the Burma. You can see uh, grooming carrying on after the feeding. So while this buffalo removes the remnant, I mean this lion removes the remnants of that buffalo off himself, let's go have a look at a live buffalo with Jamie. Very much a live buffalo and also rather chilly on this windy morning. This is what you're going to, or I'm going to find most of the animals doing, most of the ruminants doing lying down and just contemplating life. Not really all that keen to stand up and expose themselves to the chilly wind. So a lazy start for the animals of Juma. Not the oxpeckers though, they are industriously up and about as soon as the sun starts to peek over the horizon and going about their daily business of tick gathering and feeding. I know this buffalo fairly well. It's actually quite a nervous individual at times, but he seemed quite content now to relax, enjoy a morning lion, and allow the ox peckers to go about their cleaning. Don't want to take you away from those lions for too long, especially not if there are other vehicles waiting to join that sighting. So jump back onto the back of Brent's vehicle. So you can see I uh, still a prepping and preening and cleaning, or he is. And if we look carefully on his skin, we might be able to even pick up some ticks and things. Oh, and that's the end of that. Time for a schnooze, belly full of buffalo. You can see, even though it's a really cool morning, how heavily he's panting from digesting that meat. He almost looks like he's so fat, he's uncomfortable. Now, quite often when lions are very full like this, sometimes they'll roll onto their back to take it, there we go, to take a bit of weight off the belly. <laughs> so Sandra is wondering if tuberculosis is airborne, could humans catch it if they came into contact with buffalo? Sandra, bovine tuberculosis uh, would have to be transferred by the consumption of fresh and raw meat or blood. So we're quite safe from catching the tuberculosis from buffalo. So guys, I think that's about it. The other male has also stopped feeding and I don't think they're going to be doing too much more for the foreseeable future. There are quite a lot of other game drive vehicles who are trying to get in here and we've been a little bit spoilt and we've actually had them doing something rather than sleeping. So I think we're going to move out and let some other people come enjoy. Bye bye, fat kitty. Just get out of here carefully. Eric in New York is wondering, is there a part of the buffalo that the lion won't eat? They're unable to digest the, the horns and the hooves, Eric. There's that other lion there, far away. So that's what they won't eat. Also, this looks like a buffalo cow. The, the top of her skull and that will even be too thick for a hyena or lion to break apart. So there's another section they won't get to the brain. But there's very specialized little insects, certain carrion beetles and scarab beetles 
that main purpose is to actually climb into the cavities and digest the brain matter and all the sinew and little bit and little tendons and stuff that the other animals aren't able to get to. Okay, watch out, GoPro. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Thanks, Vata. Stations, uh, whoever's first station standing by for Lengala Lock, welcome to make your way. I'm moving out. So, what a great way to start the sunrise safari. So, Lala and Bill are wondering, is there a pecking order amongst that coalition about who gets to eat first? Most definitely there. There is definitely a sort of a ranking or hierarchy in male lion coalitions, but it is quite a fluid thing that changes. So, it depends on who's had the most to eat beforehand. So, if relatively full, won't fight too much for first bite at the carcass. But there's definitely a hierarchy and there's more competition for mating rights than, uh, than real food rights at the carcass. But a lot of the time that, that hierarchy is very, very similar. So whoever is the most, not necessarily the biggest, you know, the most aggressive lion quite often gets first choice at everything. But as I said, those type of things with those male lines, it's not always the same line at the top. It does go in cycles. The one male might have got a wound and stuff, so he's not going to be able to fight as well as he could have. So there is a little bit of movement up and down, uh, complete, always changing in, those, in the social hierarchy of, of those male lines. Mike says, could hyena smell that carcass? Would they challenge the male lions for it? Now, Mike, I'm pretty sure that hyenas are quite aware where that carcass is. But no hyena clan in their right mind would take on five fit male lions. They probably wouldn't even take on one fit male lion. So uh, they definitely would not go near that carcass. Male lions are so much bigger and stronger than a lioness. Uh, you will find hyenas will really irritate uh, young male lions and lionesses, but they don't really mess around with adult males. So while we make our way back towards Juma, let's go see what Jamie's up to. While Brent crosses back towards Juma, we've just come to visit the old hyena den that's on Philemon's cut line. The reason I've popped in here is just because I saw a couple of very fresh hyena tracks heading across in this direction. But it is a false alarm. No hyena here. Could just be the males moving through an area. Their tracks just looked tiny enough to maybe be a sub-adult. I think for now we're going to just start heading further and further east. See if there's any sign of Karula heading back to the south. Watch your heads everyone. Washington has a general question about the various shots and inoculations that one must have in order to work in this kind of industry. Uh, Lael, you'll find that most of us are not too bothered by, because we don't really work with hands-on contact with the animals, 
That being said, having a tetanus injection for us is quite an important thing. I know that personally I have a tendency to cut myself on a regular basis, with things like rusty metal. The last one was a, a sign that I tried to jump over that had been there for some 50 odd years and was very rusty. So tetanus shots are a good thing. And very recently with the tremendous rabies outbreak that occurred around Pittsburgh, both Brent and myself got hold of some rabies vaccinations. Just on the off chance, especially it wasn't so much for our work here, because the outbreak wasn't as bad as it was close to Hoodsprayt, but just in case when we were staying on Brent's parents or at Brent's parents' house, that there was, there's always a chance of a squirrel or a bat or something that is a carrier of rabies or a jackal. Because when animals with rabies, they demonstrate an unusual friendliness at times, almost like they're habituated, they lose their fear of people. And so you run the risk of becoming exposed to rabies in that way. So we had rabies vaccinations. Usually I haven't been too bothered about keeping up with my rabies vaccines, but it was something that was necessary this time around or this year. In terms of what tourists need, different countries will have, or your, your travel profession, medical professionals will have different advice. For example, we don't really take malaria prophylaxis out here. It's a very low risk area for malaria, particularly after the drought. But a lot of doctors do recommend that if you come to this area, you should be taking malaria prophylaxis. For us, it would be almost impossible for us to keep up with the demands in that way. So just check here very carefully for hyenas. Their tracks are moving through here. Nope. No sign of them there. I wonder why they were all wandering along this road. In terms of what vaccinations you need and what you should, just have a chat if you're going to come and visit South Africa. Have a chat to your doctor. For the most part, it's, fa it's a fairly safe country in terms of exposure to diseases. You'll find that most of the people who've come to visit, it, it's actually more about visa requirements than anything else. Travelling further north towards Zambia, Tanzania, you might find that if you need those visas or those pass, being able to go into those areas, you might have to get something like a yellow fever vaccination as well. Just depends on where you're going. And bearing in mind, of course, that South Africa as a country, despite what the, the, the certain rumours that fly about, actually has an exceptionally advanced medical care system. Uh, there's very, very good doctors out here and probably if you find yourself bitten by a snake, for example, or something like that, you'll probably find that South Africa doctors are the best in the world, except par for maybe the Australian doctors who also have to deal with some nasty toxins out there, or nasty venom. Ours, our doctors are incredibly experienced, particularly in the low felt, with dealing with snake bites. nicely with our talk about immigration and shots and requirements. UK expat was wondering if we got a good amount of rain last night. And no, we didn't. We didn't get any rain last night, unfortunately. Definitely not what I was expecting. And I mean, you'd think that with all of this wind and the clouds, although they seem to be dissipating as well now, that we would have had a little bit of a drizzle. I really thought it was going to. We had bets going. So far, the only person who proved to be correct was Jerry in final control. She didn't think it was going to rain. I really did think it was going to rain, so I'm actually almost disappointed that it hasn't. We could have used a little bit more rain to help us with this drought just towards the end of the rainy season. Now all we've got is freezing cold blowing wind and nothing to show for it. I really am very, very surprised that we haven't got any rain. Don't think that's what I thought it was.
Now, Siberia Zoomie's been keeping an eye on the bird life around the various areas, and in particular, Pete's Pond. And she's noticed that the... Sorry, I'm distracted by more buffalo lying on the ground. She's noticed that the masked weavers are now furiously nest building after the rain. And was wondering if we've noticed any increased activity on our side. Doing exactly the same thing as our buffalo were doing earlier. And the answer to that, Siberia Zumi, on the subject of birds is I've actually seen very few weavers while I've been here. They have nests around Treehouse Dam that are older. None of them look particularly fresh. I haven't seen much in the way of activity and weaver activity. But we'll keep an eye out, check around the dams. Maybe it's just been a slight delay and that they will be nest building once again very soon. Interestingly enough, a friend of mine who works closer to the Drakensberg Mountains, but not too far away from here, says that she's never seen as many weavers as she has this year. Now, that particular reserve has had, because it's close to the Drakensberg Mountains, which have trapped some of the rain clouds over them, has had a little bit more rain than we have. And I think that might have played a role in the movement of bird species. They seem to be trying to follow at least the, the rain and the insect population explosions. And maybe for weavers, which of course are not really big insect eaters, might bring an influx of seeds as well. But I'll keep an eye out, Siberia Zumi. I actually haven't seen that many weavers this year at all. We'll keep checking. Bye, -bye Buffalo. Enjoy your windy morning. Now, although we've seen the buffalo all resting and lying down, none of them have been fast asleep. And Sandra, you are in essence correct. Sandra's heard that buffalo only really sleep for a minute or two at a time because they are constantly needing to be vigilant in terms of checking for predators. And Sandra, that applies actually to most of the game species. It's not that easy to fall into a nice, or not that safe to fall into a nice deep sleep when there are animals out here that could hunt you. They're not like us where we can retreat to our homes and our fortresses behind fences and locked doors, which is why actually some of the animals are so nervous. Um, I thought that would be the case. Hello, Karula Tracks. Sorry, let me show you what I mean. I just had a funny feeling she might come this way. There you go. Can you see them there, Jandre? Perfect, neat little leopard tracks. There's nothing, nothing more perfect looking than a paw print of a leopard, in my opinion. They're just so neat. Walking fairly fast along this road in the direction of a treehouse dam. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't see any further along towards the buffalo, so I think she's gone off into this drainage line. Now, as you know, I'm not going to be following up too much, just in case she does. She has moved her cubs to a drainage line den site. But we will move along the road along the side and just see if we can catch a glimpse of her, because I'm certain that she would have been out hunting last night. So while we investigate and double check which way she's gone, let's find out how Brent's morning's going. So I just heard the wonderful news that Jamie has seen Queen Karula tracks. So we're not too far from her. So we're going to check that area a little bit uh, to the sort of south of Treehouse Waterhole. See if we can find any tracks. There we go. Go ahead. Going east along Elephant Carcass Road towards the drainage line around the Treehouse Dam. Copy, thanks. I'm on Gowrie Main. Do you want me to check Weaver's Nest? I'm oh, sorry, on uh, Weaver's Nest from Gowrie Main, or do you want me to check Shabam? Um, Gowrie 
Sorry, please repeat. I'm on the Gary Main at the moment. Would you like me to check Weaver's Nest from Gary Main or Shabam? I'm going to go back to towards Weaver's Nest and maybe if you check Shabam and then work your way east from there. Copy, will do. Some exciting stuff. Uh, we're going to be you a quick update. Two, two vehicles in there. Sorry, I just going to be on the radio with yours. Uh, morning, yours. Uh, any updates so far? As in Gonzalo of Wansati, Ingwe, uh, on elephant carcass heading towards tree houses. Two stations uh, following up in that area at the moment. Copy that, Ben. Then just quickly tell me, if it's possible, um, that elephant uh, that. Um, uh, your campus, is that the one of the uh, home in the city? Yeah, on the street, yeah. Like 50 millimeters home. What are you wanting? How's it? ABS breaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good thing. Um, I'm going to go to the house down at the moment. Yeah, so Jamie's following up. So she's, she was, we had tracks of her around Vietella yesterday. Okay. And then also Buffalo's hook, and then in the Mawati, she's been zigzagging a lot. Okay. Oh, look at the kudu, guys. <coughs> yeah. Well, kudu, yeah. Well, we're going to go and see if we pop out around Shabam, that side. Oh. I'm going to go there anyway, just cool. to take a look. Maybe she'll come back somewhere in through the night or whatever. Perfect. Good luck. Enjoy. Enjoy. Sorry about this, guys. It just seems everything's happening. Uh, sorry, yours. Um, just chatting to the arathusa guys. Uh, if that is affirmative. That elephant does have a big hole in his left ear. So it seems the naughty elephant's been naughty again, but this time on Buffalo's hook. Okay, so exciting stuff. So Cedric is going to go check down there whether he can find any tracks of crew lab. So Tingana was chasing an unidentified male leopard yesterday to the east of us. And James Richards wondering, could it be Gajima? Now, Gajima is a very skittish male leopard that comes in from the north. James, I think it's unlikely. I think it's more likely in the area where that was happening to be either in Vula Quarantine or Quarantine are the two leopards that are seen most in that area. So Yajima seems to be further to the north and east. And I spotted something marching down the road. And there it is. It's a wildly beast. A lone wildebeest bull. in search of ladies. So next month is, or end of this month, beginning of next month, the wildebeest actually start their rut. So it'll be fascinating to see. He looks like he's on a mission. Hello, mister. And you can see all the animals are going to be very nervous in this high winds. So a lot of the herbivores, or what we consider mostly to be prey species, are going to be a bit jumpy. So we've got a very interesting question that I don't know the answer to from a spirit in the sky. Should I know? Do the antelope here have a problem with blue tongue? So I'm not exactly sure what blue tongue is. So maybe if you can send me a little bit more information about blue tongue, uh, maybe we call it something else here, or maybe it's a, a disease we don't get uh, in Southern Africa. So if anyone can send me a little bit more information about what blue, blue tongue is, uh, hopefully then I can be a little bit more helpful. And uh, remember, you can pop that information in an email to me on questions at wildearth.tv or you can just use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So we're just double checking where we've checked already very carefully. Now, leopards being a lot lighter than lions, uh, it makes their tracks just that more difficult to see.
So nothing just yet. We are in search of the Queen of Juma, who has got two cubs, or the last we heard. So Ellen in North Dakota is wondering, how long would she leave her cubs for? Now, Ellen, that's completely dependent. It can be anything from a few hours to a few days. Uh, but at this young age, she's probably not going to leave them for more than two days. But uh, it is possible she can leave them for up to four or five days as they get older. So Jamie's checking from that side. We're going to come down from the western side. I'm just going to be going very, very slowly and make sure we don't miss any tracks. Now, this is a favorite haunt of Karula, this area around the treehouse waterhole. We've enjoyed many fantastic sightings of it around here. The first time I ever saw Karula was probably about 100 meters uh, to the south of us here. But positive news, we didn't find any tracks crossing our southern traverse edge. And yesterday, fortunately, there were some so, uh, there was some road maintenance done yesterday, so this road's been dragged, which will make it a little bit easier to see tracks. Okay, checking carefully here. Now, there's some wonderfully big termite mounds around this area. The Krula root has we've often found her sitting on top, looking for potential prey species. Also, where we get these little monkey orange thickets, like we've got over here. This is quite a small one. Uh, it's re a really favorite area of Stenbok and Dyker, which is Karula's preferred prey. Looks like we might get a little bit of light through the clouds. Actually, this particular area, I've had many fantastic leopard sightings. It was also a favorite hangout of my favorite leopard, Kunyuma. I definitely wouldn't mind a little visitation from Mr. Snarly Pants. Joe is wondering, what is the loudest animal in Africa? I would probably say a human being on a weekend with a, with a big sound system, but uh, I think Joe's referring to something else. Uh, I would probably say it's between elephant and lion uh, for the, the loudest in terms of decibels. I'm not exactly sure, but I think an elephant trumpet might top the pops. Uh, if not, I think it's a lion roar. So thank you very much to Kyle, Spirit in the Sky, and Star, 
who sent me a bit more information on blue tongue disease. Apparently it is an insect-borne virus that causes swelling in the tongue, lesions on the feet, a high fever, and swelling of the face. Um, well, I, I have not heard of it. Uh, it might be a high fault species, but I will have to actually double check whether it occurs in this area. But I have not uh, ever heard of blue tongue disease in the low fault, but I will check with uh, our local wildlife vet, see if he can shed some light. And it was first noted in South Africa. I nearly forgot that part. So it does occur in South Africa, but where is another question. So Lucy in Indiana is saying, that's the first wildebeest we've seen in a while. Do I know where they all went? So Lucy, you'll notice we're seeing less wildebeest and less zebra at the moment. Uh, with the rain, those animals will spread out. They don't have to be so concentrated around water as they were when we hadn't had any rain. So they, they literally spread out everywhere. Uh, quite a lot of them, I would say, have gone in a small local migration, uh, probably towards the Kruger Park and the southern Manuleti on the big basalt grasslands you get there on the Gabros, so where there's a lot of nice green Thamida which is uh, Natal red grass, which is one of the best grazing grasses out there if you're a herbivore. So still no tracks as of yet. We're approaching a treehouse waterhole at the moment. And VM and I are scanning the bush very intently. We are very keen to find a leopard. And the nice thing about going really slowly and quietly like this is we do give our ears a chance, just a chance, to hear an alarm call. But in this gusting wind, that will make that a little more difficult. Oh, and look what we have at the waterhole. A pair of knob-billed ducks. I'm just going to go around to see if we can get to a good position to see them. Hopefully they don't take off. Uh, the first two of this rainy season were seen yesterday. I had a very brief visual of a flying one, and then Jamie had a nice visual of one. But there we got a male and a female. And you can see the other name for a knob bull duck is a comb duck. So the correct terminology for that large protrusion on his beak is a comb. So they will only have that during the summer breeding months, and uh, during winter it will fall off. So of course the males with the biggest combs are the most impressive to the ladies. And you'll find almost all the little pans at the moment might have a few knob ducks around them. So they're great wanderers, and they'll fly all over the low fault in search of pans and puddles and dams to spend their time in. We're going to continue searching for Queen Karula. Thank you to Bob G, uh, who's got a little bit more information on blue tongue. So um, blue tongue affects sheep mostly in South Africa, but is often not fatal. But it also affects horses, and in horses it is fatal. So that's very interesting. Now, 
you probably find the fact that the only information you'll find is that it, it's affecting domestic livestock. Unfortunately, I don't know too much about domestic livestock. I know a bit more about the wild livestock. So you probably find most of the animals that are out in the wild have a natural immunity to that virus. Okay. Just check where Jamie is, see if there's any updates on the, those tracks. Jamie, Jamie. Anybody? Jamie, you got any update on those in Konza? Chris, it looks like they've cut down into the straightage line just to the south of it across the Road. I'm going to try and see if they've crossed through the nest around with it. Okay, thanks. I've done Shabam and Weaver's Nest now past Treehouse Waterhole and still slowly heading down towards uh, Treehouse and Weaver's Nest Junction. We will keep checking carefully. Copy that. So there's a very strong likelihood that Jamie and I are going to bump into each other. Oh, first raindrop of the morning on my schnoz. But I'm going to keep checking. So it looks like the tracks have gone down into this little creek system, this dry creek system that we're driving parallel to. And hopefully they'll pop out just up ahead is where we both think they might pop out if they do. If not, they're going to, she might have stayed in the block between Twin Dams and Weaver's Nest. But let's go get an update on those tracks from the person who's on them. Brent and myself checking really carefully for tracks of where Karula might have gone. Now remember I pulled over to the side and I stopped and I looked for a little while, just a bit earlier. Now I'm looking at a mark in the road and I'm trying to work out if it's a drag mark. What I'm going to do is I'll pull over a little bit so that you can see properly. It's a bit tricky because there's something of a, there's a bit of a tree in my way. I think that's probably a muscle too. You can sort of see it there. I'm just going to hop out and see if there's not tracks around it. I couldn't decide if it was a... Earlier I, I dismissed it as an ant trail. But I'm not sure that it is, and I just want to get out and check really carefully because now I can actually see it moving off onto the side of the road. Which way is my light going to be best? My light's probably going to be best like this. Now, when you're looking for drag marks as opposed to an ant trail, you're looking for stones that have been dislodged. So ants walk over the stones, they don't leave any kind of mark. They just leave a sort of a clear place where the, the sand has been trampled. But when something is dragged, because it's on the ground, it will pull stones along with it, which is why I just want to check really carefully along here. It looks, I can't see any tracks on either side, but the soil type is not the easiest. After, we're, after it's become a little bit damp, leopards barely at times leave a footprint in the sand. I'm just going to check a bit further along here as well. Hmm. Doesn't look as though the stones have been disturbed. The buffalo are just off to my right. Now we've spoken about how perfect this weather is for hunting. To look a little bit further down here. We'll drive along a little bit, see if there's any tracks coming out of this block. Otherwise, I do want to go for a bit of a walk in the drainage line. Don't see anything. That's a perfect place for her to hide a kill if this is a drag mark. It just seems to tie in perfectly with her tracks wandering along this road in this dark and windy weather. Leopards, of course, being very cryptically coloured. It's not all that easy, always that easy to spot them in here. I think she might be. If she has dragged a kill down into this drainage line, 
the chances are that her cubs are not with her. She's not likely to take a kill back to a den site. We'll go down and just quickly trick, check the other side of the drainage line. If there's nothing there, then I'll come back here and go for a walk to see if there's any sign of her. It's just not quite right for a drag mark. They should, the stones should be more disturbed than they are. The ground should be more disturbed than it is. Oh, better not crash into our friendly tree. One of the first things I did when I first started working here, still getting used to the lay of the land, so to speak, and I went across towards the, um, the big jackalberry tree that sits on Gauri Cutline, and I'm convinced one day I'm going to see a leopard there. It hasn't happened yet, but it's such a perfectly formed leopard tree. And I went to check there with Viam, and I completely forgot there was a dead tree behind me, reversed straight into it and showered poor Viam in a collection of bark and twigs. Good morning. Morning, morning. So How's it, guys? Last tracks? Last tracks are just a little bit further around that corner, probably about 20 meters away. Okay, I haven't just... checked the whole of Gary Main, right? Okay. Just have a look. I need a second opinion on a mark in the road. Okay. And there's no stones disturbed, so I'm not sure if it's not just an ant trail. Okay, well, There's no look. tracks, but go have a look and see Andre what you is think. blowing us kisses, trying to make us have funny faces on camera. <laughs> um, okay, um, are you going to walk or do you want me to walk in here? You're welcome to walk down there. I'll, walk, I'll see what's happening over there. Perfect. Oh, okay. Okay. Just check and see if you think that's a drag mark or if it's just an ant trail. Cool. Okay. Bye bye. bye. Such a perfect hiding place in here. Let's see what Brent's second opinion thinks about that particular mark. Okay, so Brent's come in from the western side of us around treehouse dam but neither of us have gone down this road and into the dip let's just see oh no that's not true i can see brent's tracks coming out of this dip so her tracks haven't really popped out around here so that drag or that mark could well be a drag mark of her with a kill somewhere in this drainage line Ooh. howling wind All right, Brent agrees with me. It's not quite right for a drag mark. He thinks it's an ant trail as well. Hyena tracks in the road. So where has this leopard disappeared off to? We'll go and check around here. Check the southern boundary more carefully. Looks as though, judging from Brent's tire tracks, he's checked this particular junction very carefully. So now it's just a question of, is she around here? <laughs> Siberia Zubi has said that she thinks Karula needs to adopt the breadcrumb method of, sorry, that he thinks that, um, Karula should have dropped the breadcrumb method of helping us follow her. Karula is one of the hardest leopards to track in this particular environment. She, I don't know what it is about the way that she moves. She just has a very interesting way of totally changing direction and going off in the opposite way that you expect her to. One of those fascinating little aspects about her, all leopards are tricky to track, especially in this light and especially in this kind of light, cloudy day, and after rain when the soil's all compacted. Nevertheless, we've spoken to trackers, Jeffrey and Bright, for example, the gentlemen that come in to help us over Big Cat Week, 
They also agree that she's one of the most difficult leopards they've ever tracked. She's a clever girl, that one. Now, Linda, you were saying if the kill is small, would it leave that kind of a mark? And Linda, potentially yes, particularly if Karula was lifting it with her head, the way that leopards walk, and you've seen, some of the regular viewers will definitely have seen leopards move their kills before. They lift their heads right up, so they pull that kill up. So if it was just something small like a steenbok, and she was pulling it across the road, it might just be one hoof that might be dragging along, or an, an ankle that might drag along. But as I said, when I stopped at that track, no stones moved, nothing shifted away where it might have caught on something. And this is definitely in the kind of weather where animals play hide, hide and seek with us. These are all hyena tracks. It's also a possibility. I've seen these hyena tracks coming from way back towards Philemon's cut line. These are the tracks that I led me to check the hyena den initially, or the old hyena den at Philemon's cut line. Now, there's a possibility that they made off with Karula's kill if she did have one. It's all guesswork at this point. It's all just putting together the different clues and trying to build up a story of what happened. Sometimes we get all the pieces of evidence, sometimes we don't get any, except for the odd footprint, print of a toe. Megan, Megan is watching and she hasn't seen a leopard yet on our live safaris and she's very excited by the prospect of seeing one. And Megan, it just so happens as well that we're tracking one of our favorite leopards, probably one of the most famous leopards in the world, the Queen of Juma, Karula. And not only are we, we are gonna be very careful in the way that we track her, Megan, because she is, she does have two very young cubs. They're only about a month and a half old, so about six weeks old. So if, there are, if there's any sign that she might, as far as we know, she's been denning on the southern side of the reserve, so across our southern boundary, which is where we are now. But as far as we know, those are where the cubs are and she's been out hunting. But that doesn't mean that she hasn't moved them at some point. So whilst we are tracking and checking carefully, we are not going to go crashing into a drainage line or anything like that in a way that could disturb her and her cubs. There's an interesting suggestion from Siberia Zumi that perhaps she's been around vehicles, because she's been around vehicles her whole life, and she most definitely has, she is an incredibly relaxed leopard in our presence. And actually, funnily enough, she's more relaxed, she's even more relaxed with people on foot than any leopard I've ever encountered in my life. Um, so Siberia Zumi suggested perhaps she's learned to move without leaving tracks for us to find. I'm not sure if it's that well considered or if it's to do with the fact that she is just a secretive leopard by nature. Perhaps she wants to, and she is getting older as well, which might factor in. Do I think that she's capable of deliberately move? I don't think she'll move about without wanting to leave tracks, but I do think that if she doesn't want to be seen, she won't be. If a vehicle finds her and she wants to lose them, she will. She'll go straight off, she'll duck down, let the vehicle carry on in one direction and she'll move off in a different direction. She makes it very, very clear when she's, happened to be, when she's happy to be seen and when she isn't. No, 
snow tracks coming out around here. We've passed the point actually where she cut into the drainage line. We'll do one more loop. We'll go north this time and see if she maybe didn't pop out further to the north. So maybe I missed her tracks cutting back across the direction she was going in. As I said, she, she likes to change direction. Now, the reason we keep chatting a bit about the possibility of a kill was, as we've mentioned this morning, and as Clayton wants to know, yes, this dark, windy weather would have been a huge advantage for the predators last night. It gives them essentially almost like a cloak of invisibility. The wind obscures their scent and the sounds that they might make by mistake. And the total and utter darkness blankets them in a way that allows them to creep up on whatever prey happens to be about. And that's why we are so keenly looking around the drainage line areas. So it's a distinctive possibility that they would move about and hunt and probably kill last night. So Clayton, yes, it would have been a huge... That's why all of our animals are so nervous since we started this morning. They've all got a, a distinct edge to their behavior. The impala, the zebra, all a bit unsettled. And that's because it is so easy for a predator to sneak up to them during the evening. And that's why we suspect that Karula's made a kill somewhere in this block. And it still remains, the mystery still remains as well about where the Inkahumas disappeared off to yesterday and last night. That's something we might unfold at the same time. Well, we have been, as we always do, keeping an eye out for Karula and Seabird was saying, well, We've been looking for her for a few days. When was the last time anybody saw her? Quite a while ago, Seabird, from what I know. I don't think she's been seen since she moved her den site, or since she was seen moving her den site to the south of Gowrie, Maine, which was about a week ago. I think it's been about that long since we last saw her. Probably longer that we've had her on the live safaris. She's around, though. She's behaving as a female leopard does when they have cubs. We'll go check further to the north. Oh, there's Brent giving an update. I know he's been tracking as well. Standing by. Confirm you've got tracks going southeast. Okay, copy. I'm at Twin Dams now. Is the Wahlberg's Eagle well spotted, Jandre? So, interestingly, what we were just saying about Karula changing direction, she was going straight west. Brent's got her tracks cutting through the drainage line, now going southeast. So we're in the perfect position as to where she would pop out. Let's go check a bit more carefully around Twin Dams. I didn't see any tracks coming out close to the dam itself, but that doesn't mean that she didn't come wandering past on the other road. Luckily for us, the roads have all been freshly dragged. Yes, that was when we last had her on our live show, which was with Brent. Where was I? I was with lions, actually. I was with the Styx females on Gowrie, Maine, when the, the little Speaks hinged tortoise wandered into our sighting, and Brent had Karula hunting far to the east of where we are now, on our eastern boundary, Cheetah Cut Line, Central Road area.
We're going to keep checking really, really carefully along this road. And then I think if there's no sign of her popping out, then one of us will move on. The other will keep looking. While I do that, let's find out or get that update from Brent personally. So I went for a little stroll down in the creek bed. Now, this weather we're experiencing at the moment with this gusting wind is a, for lack of a technical term in the garden industry, is it's called get charged weather. So I went very slowly and very carefully. I did find her tracks, and they crossed into a very thick area. So I decided discretion is the better part of valor. And I walked around, couldn't see where the tracks came out. But her general direction was down towards Twin Dams. So I'm just checking now. We'll probably bypass Jamie again shortly. Just very carefully looking for tracks here. Yeah? So Joel in New York would like to know, do we have any idea what sex the cubs are? Joel, I have not the foggiest. When I saw them, they were about seven hours old and near impossible to tell. So no idea what sex the cubs are yet. We're going to have to wait until they're a little bit older and we can view them nicely. Kyle would like to know if we had any updates on Tingana. It's been a while since we've seen them. Uh, Kyle, actually, uh, we tracked him yesterday, but unfortunately he crossed to, our, to the east, and uh, he was chasing another male leopard in Torchwood. And then I know they had him in the afternoon heading south. So I think he's on Chitwa Chitwa or somewhere about, about those parts at the moment. It's still chilly. Definitely not a big fan of the the cold. And I'm just checking very, very, very carefully. Come on, Karula. Well, there's a strong possibility she's still in here. And maybe she's got some meat in there. So I think while I keep checking, I might do another walk a little later, but a little bit away from that thicket up on the sort of more open ridge system here, where she probably would have been hunting. Have a look in all those tall marula trees. See if we find any tree climbing antelope. And while we look for a leopard, Noctua, uh, Noctua is wondering, do bearded vultures occur as far south as South Africa? In some places, it, they found that it only occur in Ethiopia, and other places say they occur all over Africa. Well, they have very, very specific sort of uh, habitat requirements. We do get them in South Africa, but only high up in the Drakensberg Mountains. 
I've seen them in, I think it was Ta Kenya also, but very high up. But I think the largest population is correctly in Ethiopia, but they do occur as far down south as South Africa. Now, very difficult to say, these Franklin, there are some Franklin alarm calls up ahead. And I'm just trying to see if there's not a bird of prey around. But let's just go have a quick look. I was actually going to go on a bit of gut instinct and go check the Mawati in there. But as we're moving down there, it's like Frank and coming in this sector here. stopped now. They might also in this wind just be having a moment. Just look very carefully. Might be able to see some nice tracks here. Amazing how quiet these cold, windy mornings are. Morning, Brian. No, Carol in New York would like to know how many litters does Karula has Karula had? Uh, Carol, uh, if I think I think it's eight. No, it can't be that many. Uh, a lot of our viewers have been watching Karula longer than than I have, but I think uh, it's I think it's six or possibly seven with one lost litter that we know about. And she's probably lost a few more, and we just haven't seen them. But uh, she is a very successful uh, mother, considering the fact that the mortality rate on average for leopard cubs in the Sabi Sands is around 75%. So while we check very carefully here, I think I might move back to where, where last tracks were and take a stroll. Uh, in the meantime, let's go see what Jamie's up to. I'm also checking really carefully around this area. So far, the only life I've managed to spot, apart from the Wahlbergs that Jean Ray saw, is a little Speaks hinged tortoise that is racing away from us at high speed in full running mode. <laughs> That's about as fast as our Speaks hinge tortoises will go. Go, buddy, go. They are rejoicing in this weather. Not so much because of the cool, because the cool's gonna make them feel a little bit lazy and cold, being exotherms. But so much green grass for them to nibble on. Off he pops disappearing beneath the bushes and the drainage line. I'm going to do one more circuit. I haven't seen Karula's tracks coming out, and I don't want both of us focusing for too long on where Karula's disappeared off to. That 
And speaking about, since we have been tracking Karula, Kim was wondering, do we have any updates on Karula's daughter, Shadow, and her cubs? And Kim, from what I understand, Shadow was seen yesterday on Arethusa. And for those of you familiar with the Arethusa geography, she's in one of her favorite drainage line systems, one where we found her on a regular basis that runs to the east of the Arethusa Dam. She was seen there with her cub. And we didn't follow up from there just because that cub is even younger than Karula's cubs. So we've left her to, but it seems as though she's decided to hide her cubs out in the drainage line of, or in the drainage line systems of Arethusa. So wonderful news there, very, very exciting. We do have the prospect of some amazing times ahead with our leopards and our lions actually, between the pregnant six females, Karula with her cubs, and now Shadow with hers. Definitely been an exceptionally fortunate year for all of them. I'm just a bit tangled up here, sorry. Let's fix my earpiece. Managed to wrap itself in my jacket. Now, even the birds are a little bit quiet this morning. They're only just starting to come out. There's a very sweet little one there. Hopefully it's going to stay. It's going to... You've got it there, Jean. It's down on the ground. The dead tree on the top of that dead fallen tree. The little branch. There we go. Perfect. One very cold looking little bee eater. All fluffed up and shivering. Heads darting about looking for food. This actually happens to be my favorite bee eater species. Even though the carmines are big and striking and the white throated are also very brightly colored. I love the colors of the little bee eater also known as the springbok bird, partly because of the way in which they hunt, but mostly because the colors of this bee eater match up perfectly to our rugby team. As most of you will know, South Africans and rugby go hand in hand. Almost all of us have grown up watching and supporting rugby teams in our time. Look at its head darting about the place, looking for a potential insect prey. And chatting a bit about birds, Aqua would like to know if there are any bird species that prefer to nest around homes and possibly even become something of problematic bird species. Aqua, I'm going to keep driving just so I can check the, towards the eastern side of the reserve. Aqua, swallows. Swallows really like to nest around homes. Doesn't make them, particularly the lesser striped swallow, seems to be one that likes the eaves of the roofs to set up their lovely little mud constructions, their mud homes. And that's also one of my favorite birds. It sounds like R2-D2, it's called. That was a very poor impression, but that's exactly, to me, they sound like R2-D2. There's an African hoopoe. So maybe the bird's starting to wake up now. Probing the ground. This is my dad's favorite bird. They get so intently involved in their search for grubs underneath the soil that they'll get distracted enough. If you stay still, particularly in Johannesburg, if you stay still and let them come past you, they'll actually walk right up to your legs because they're so focused on finding things under the ground. The nerve cells, very, very sensitive around the beaks. I can hear a southern boo-boo as well, which has become my, my problem bird in its own way in terms of getting it on camera. And my nemesis. I wouldn't get any closer. He just gave me a sideways glance. Isn't this a stunning bird? With its crest up, that striking, almost zebra-like pattern on the wings, and tan head. You can see, check, out, check in the way that it's working. It just taps its bill ever so carefully on the soil surface and immediately we'll get an idea and a feel for any vibrations or movement 
that might be occurring under the soil. And as soon as something likely happens, it will stop and dig that long beak down beneath the surface and inevitably come up with a worm of some kind or a larvae of some kind. Well, we're talking a bit about birds and their ability or their habits of nesting around homes. And to, in answer to Aqua's question, and I think I'm just going to answer that question on the other side of this dip, just in case we disappear. Let's see how we go. I will race through. a striped swallow. The only way that they've ever been a menace to me, Aqua, was <laughs> I was standing outside the kitchen, looking in and sitting, standing right underneath the swallow's nest, chattering away, and the entire swallow's nest collapsed on my head, showering me with mud. And it's actually, they're quite heavy. Speaking from experience, they're quite heavy. Everybody thought it was absolutely hilarious, and I suppose in hindsight it probably was. Luckily, there were no chicks or eggs or anything like that. It was in the, in the non-breeding season, so it wasn't their breeding season, which is obviously why they hadn't been reinforcing it. They would lift their migratory species, so they'd left and left us with their old homes, which obviously that one not quite built up to the usual architectural standards of the lesser striped swallow. Maybe that's why they never used it after that. But yes, then half the swallow's nest collapsed on my head. So that's the only way in which one could consider them to be problem bird species. Red-billed buffalo weavers also like to nest. They like human structures to provide their nest with, and also the trees that people tend to plant in their garden. Trees like fever trees is one of their favorite nesting spots. Now, as we've seen with red-billed buffalo weavers, they like to supplement their nest and strengthen their nest with every variety of thorn tree or thorn twig that Africa is able to provide. And speaking from experience, Africa provides a wide variety of thorny trees. What that means is, woe betide those who walk beneath a buffalo weaver's nest with bare feet or indeed with sandals on because you will find yourself with a thorn in your foot. Well, that's, that's, I suppose, the only way they could be considered to be problem bird species. The rest of them, for the most part, are not problematic at, at all. The only really flying thing that could be considered slightly problematic is the presence of bats living within roofs, and that they really do enjoy doing. Our bats, when they've been living in an area for a long time, their excrement builds up in the roof and can be a vector or serious breeding ground, ground for different diseases. That is something that's entertaining. Same house that I was talking about where the swallow's nest fell on me. And just by the way, the company did provide us with lovely accommodation. It was just the animals sometimes out to get us. Ah, oh, this is very cool. I shall keep my bat story for another time. Look at this. He's found his lady friend. He's managed to attract her with his industrious dung ball building skills. And she has grabbed onto it and is sitting there quite happily, letting him push her around. She's not there just for the sake of having an easy ride. Whoopsie. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well done. And he's back up. Oh, a day in the life of a dung beetle. First, you have to roll the dung ball, then you've got to find a lady friend, then you've got to push her around, plus the dung, be the dung ball. Uh, she must be feeling fairly motion sick at this point, but she's there for a very important reason. 
she changes the shape of the ball ever so slightly so that if he does drop it or let it go on a hill, she acts almost like a stopper to keep it from rolling away from him. That's about the only purpose that I can see for her presence on this dung ball. She will, once they get to a suitable digging spot, this is amazing, he's rolled a very impressive dung ball. Well done, buddy. You've been successful with your morning. He's definitely wooed her with his impressive industrial actions this morning. They're going to go and find a nice safe spot, at which point both of them will bury the ball. They will mate. She will lay her eggs within the center of it. And then they will go off on their separate ways and leave their offspring. They have at least provided for them in the form of dung food for when those eggs and larvae do hatch. Now, the, dung, the, the larvae of a dung beetle that size is a, quite a large animal. It's probably about the size of my pinky finger. So not a small creature. I'm going to go forward a bit so we can continue to watch his progress. I've done walks with guests where we have watched dung beetles for about two hours before. Just absolutely fascinated by the way in which they work. Here is he. Oh, he's found himself in such a tricky spot. Is that okay there, Jandre? Hmm? Um, he's, he's, he's stuck. He's stuck against the log. Oh, no. Is he going to try and dig down? He is digging. I, I can't quite decide if he's digging because he's trying desperately to push this ball. No, he's definitely digging. He is, I think he's decided this is the place for the dung ball to be. Oh, this is very cool. We don't often get to see this. He's also covered in some kind of mite. It's common to see mites on dung beetles, but I've never seen them to quite this extent. The mites keep them clean and stop them from... their joints from getting too covered in dung and dirt. This is awesome. He's going to dig it right down. Look at him go. Snoop has said that this brings whole new meaning to picking up a lady. Um, Mr. Dung Beetle, I don't think that was quite deep enough, to be completely honest. I think you might have been overly ambitious there. What on earth is all over him? They're like, they're not mites, they're like flies. That's a first for me, I've never seen that. I'm gonna have to look that phenomenon up. Look at him dig. Come on, lady, jump off the dung ball and give him a hand. Now Mike was wondering, do dung beetles ever take a day off? And I think perhaps Mike, he's, uh, well, he has earned a bit of time off after he manages to plant this particular dung ball. It's still not deep enough, Mr. Dung Beetle. That's not hidden well enough. They have to dig them down because honey badgers are going to, honey badgers are going to come through and dig. There is something of a tree situation in front of my vehicle. What I can do is reposition completely so that we come from the other side and maybe we'll get a better view from that side. We do have a, a monkey orange problem in front of us. But we'll go, we'll turn around and we'll view it from the side. That might work a little better. I really want to see him dig it down. I've never seen the completed process right up until that point. Oh. It's just in this monkey orange block. Oh. <laughs> We're gonna do an Austin Powers style U-turn. Chandra, how's your view from here? Is that slightly better? There we go. 
And I think he's stopped. I, there he is. Look, he's digging underneath there. I was about to say he stopped for a break. <laughs> it's almost like he's tried to dig it underneath and the dung ball has fallen on him. Now he can't get out. That's not the case, though. He's just digging it down. I thought, I really honestly thought the females helped the males dig the dung balls down, but she doesn't seem to be showing any inclination to give him a hand. Interesting question from Nok Chur. We've spoken a lot recently about the mites that cover the dung beetles and actually how essential they are to a dung beetle's survival. As the Australians discovered when they tried to when they tried to transport dung beetles from Africa across to Australia to deal with the cow dung problem and then put them in quarantine and destroyed all of the mites on their backs and promptly all the dung beetles died. So the mites are essentially a part of their survival, but Noctura would like to know whether or not those mites are within the dung ball themselves or if they are acquired as the dung beetle goes about its life, since obviously the larvae won't necessarily have them. It's a really good question, and it's one that I honestly do not know the answer to. I imagine that those mites are around the dung ball. Perhaps some of them fall off the adult dung beetles whilst this process continues and then sort of hatch or grab onto the larvae once it's metamorphosized or pupated. I'm so sorry, Franklin. Did I interrupt you? Did I interrupt you or did you interrupt me? Either way, they definitely want to have a very loud conversation. It's like being in a marketplace, talking to each other across the road. You guys can use inside voices. You're very close together. <laughs> Still digging it down. This is incredible. So the way in which it works is that she will lay her eggs within this dung ball itself. And the question remains, does she dig down into it and then lay her eggs or, and then cover it back up again? And that seems to me to be the most likely scenario the way in which she's going to do that. As I said, those dung beetle larvae are definitely attractive prospects for any animal out here. They're high in protein, they're large, they're defenseless, which is why this dung ball is such a crucial part of their survival. Honey badgers in particular are known to enjoy a snack of dung beetle larvae, and you very often found, find dung balls that have been dug up and broken open by honey badgers. Look what she's doing. She's crawling up onto the top. I'm sure that she does dig a little bit of a hole, lay her eggs, and then cover it up again. That makes the most sense to me in the way in which this would work. He's got such hard work to do. Doesn't this seem like a silly way to go about this? Don't you think it would have been more sensible to have the dung ball on the side, dig a hole, and then roll the dung ball in? Or is there a reason that he does it? Oh, no, I suppose there is a very clear reason why he does it this way. He doesn't want somebody else to come along and steal it. And dung beetles do steal from each other. Sorry, bear with me one second. Brent's just trying to get hold of me. Standing by. Copy that, Brent. I didn't see any tracks coming out on Twin Dams, but the Mesi have walked up and down all along that road, so they might have been underneath there. Brent just updating me on his search for Karula. This is quite a thrilling sighting, though. I'm now quite determined that we need to see this through. At least I have no idea how long it's going to take him to dig this bo dung ball down. I think, I mean, he's about halfway down by now. Uh, typically, the dung balls get dug down about this deep. So what is that? That's roughly 
six inches down into the ground. This is a particularly broad, I mean, this dung ball, I know you can't see exactly according to scale. It's just a little bit smaller than a tennis ball that he's trying to get down into the soil. So there you go, Jacob. You were wondering about the diameter of the ball. And I'm just going to turn my game drive channel down. There's a lot of, lot of chattering happening there. Jacob, it's about just a bit smaller than a tennis ball in terms of diameter. So he's done some very impressive work. Look at him go. This seems like such an impractical way of doing things, and yet, and yet he's already got through more than half, or, or more than half of that dung ball is underground. She looks as though she's doing something with her front legs, and I wonder if that's not preparing to or preparing a space in which to lay her eggs. She definitely isn't giving him any help here in terms of digging it down. But she's doing something. Now, Megan, as far as I know, although we know this is the female from her behavior, as far as I know, there's no physiological differences that we can see or external physiological differences that we can see that differentiate between a male and a female dung beetle. The only possibility, Megan, is that perhaps the male's front legs are a bit more prominent because they need to use them not just for rolling the dung ball and pushing it around, but also in order to fight off other males that will attempt to steal their dung ball. And there are certain dung beetles that do that. They wait for one male to put in all the hard work and then they go and they flick him with their front feet and send him flying and promptly race off with his, with, their dung, with his dung ball, only to be pursued for quite a considerable distance by a very indignant and irate male that's put in all the hard work in the first place. You just see every now and again dirt going flying from underneath there. Already he's managed to drop it down another couple of centimeters. completely agree, Clayton. It is the one huge draw card of these, or one of the huge draw cards of these live safaris. Whilst you can watch something like this on a documentary, and yes, it'll be edited, and yes, you'll probably not have to sit through some of the more boring bits, not that this is in any way boring, but sometimes you, you sort of drive around for a long time and wait for something to happen. Either way, when it is live, it makes such a huge difference, which is what, the, what Clayton was saying that it's so fascinating to watch something like this from beginning to end. I almost feel as though you get something like a sports game. That you can't, you can watch a recorded sports game, but it's not quite the same in terms of excitement. The other thing is, of course, that we can't script or predict or edit out exactly what's going to happen. So it gives you the best possible reflection, or rawest possible reflection of the way in which life works out here. She's definitely been busy doing something. She might not be helping him dig, but she's, her front legs have been working the whole time. And Siberia Zumi was wondering about the lifespan of a dung beetle. Now, there's so many different species of dung beetle out here. As far as I know, some of them longer live than others, some for a couple of months, others for up to a year or more, depending on the way in which the seasons go. Now, for these guys, they probably have a lifespan of about a year. Once they are finished with this whole process and once the dry season starts, most of the adults will die off. You never see adult dung beetles during the dry season. And it becomes the time of life for the larva to start taking over and become the new generation of dung beetles in the future. And what we're essentially watching is a perfect example of a life cycle at work. I'm totally mesmerized by it. I can't believe how much he's managed to cover in this space of time. It's based, I mean, you can barely see that dung ball now. It's all but disappeared. But he's still got a long way to go. He seems to have taken a break for the moment. One can hardly blame him for that. You can just sort of imagine him lying there. <laughs> Now, 
And just imagine him lying there underneath the dung ball, taking a bit of a breather and wondering, maybe even contemplating his existence and thinking, is this really all worth it? Is this what life is really about? Perhaps he's going to, after this, go off and buy a motorbike and head off on a cross-country trip have a bit of a midlife crisis. Because the lot of a dung beetle's life is not a pleasant one. Well, not unpleasant, I suppose. Joe? Joe, you, it's not a stupid question at all. It's actually a really good question. Insects don't have lungs. They have, oh, there he goes again. It's getting harder and harder down there. They don't have lungs. They have an open blood cavity known as a hemocell. And that hemocell, because they're fairly relatively small in size, the hemocell allows for the diffusion of gases. Uh, most insects have some kind of spiracle-like hole around their abdomens that allow for the entrance of oxygen and the exit of carbon dioxide. So a very different system to our lung, heart, blood vessel structure that mammals have. It's one of the unifying physiological features that defines an insect as an insect. So it's an open cavity rather than a, a network of little blood vessels. Look at him go. So he's underneath there, he's taking in, he's not completely surrounded by dirt, so he's not going to suffocate. He'll be letting in, and they only need small amounts of oxygen when compared to us. So he'll be quite happily breathing about underground. I wish I knew exactly what she was doing. She's sort of patting the dung ball down. She's not being helpful at all. I'm going to try, now that this dung ball has started to disappear further down into the ground, I'm going to try and see if we can't sneak even closer and see if we can't figure out exactly what it is this lady is doing. It would be the most heartbreaking way that I see this scenario ending is another male coming in and mating with her while he's down there trying to dig the hole into the ground and <laughs> leaving him to do all of the hard work. He's working so hard for a little dung beetle. We are being very closely watched by something. Let's just have a look at who's watching us. Hello, little kudu. Didn't even see you there. You snuck up on us. Come and watch this. It's really interesting. You'll be fascinated to see the byproducts of your, or the end part of the life cycle of your dung. Essentially, the clean-up operation of the bush. Kudu doesn't seem that interested, though. Fair enough. I am, though, so we're going to get a bit closer. Oh, hello, monkey orange. You OK there, Jandre? <laughs> I've actually made life easier for him. Move the stick out of his way. There we go. Okay. Now I'm a bit too close. Nevertheless, we get to see really how this is working. Look at all the flies that have gathered around them. Yep, you can see every now and again the movement of the dung ball. And then that's exactly what happens. You put your happens. You put your finger on it precisely. The dung ball starts off hollow. I mean, sorry, other way around. Starts off solid when the egg of the or the larvae of this dung beetle hatches, and it will slowly eat its way from the inside out until it becomes more and more hollow. Now, Lynn, I'm going to just look for a picture of it in my book because there's some really nice examples of what dung balls look like after honey badgers have been through them. And I'm actually distracted again by a really beautiful moth. Hold on. I'm just going to try and 
get it up without you. You keep watching the dung beetles. I'm going to just try and lift it up a little bit. Just have a look at this since the action appears to have slowed down and our gentleman is taking a breather. This is the most beautiful little moth. Looks like a Dalmatian. Now I know that Brent told me what this is and I cannot for the life of me remember. A small white moth with the black dots. It will come to me. It's something like pepper, pepper something or polka something or something to do with the beautiful little black spots that's on it. Tiny little creature. I'm going to pop it back where it was. I don't want to send it flying off into the bush since it is daytime. I'm going to stay here with our dung beetle gentleman and keep monitoring it. But let's find out what Brent has to show us, and we'll be back here shortly. So we've stopped here. We're still in search of the Queen of Duma. I did have some tracks in the block, but I'll explain those now. But VM just pointed out how busy the civet tree looks. And with all the millipedes after the rain, it seems like millipede is the main feature in the civet's diet. VM, can you get that? Hello? OK. So there's some little carrion beetles uh, that are detritus feeders. They feed off carcasses and dung. And they actually, that's the third one I've seen. The others actually buried themselves inside the dung and they are feeding off it. So I'm gonna try and get how many different species of cr critter has been fed on here. And the amazing thing is you can see millipedes are dominating. And a nice big piece. Millipede. And civet is one of the only mammals, apart from certain forest dikers that occur in Central Africa, that is able to digest a millipede because of what they feed on. Oh, this is going to be a bit fun. Horns here, stand on top. Um, because of what they feed on, uh, the, the millipedes actually have a hydrogen cyanide. So I'm going to put the different things on the dash there. What the civet has been eating. So there we go. OK. So what we've got, of course, is a nice big piece of a millipede. There we go. Now, more interesting is, there we go, a bit of a dung beetle carapace. And the head of a dung beetle. So there's multiple different species of dung beetle in there. But another thing a civet eats that, ooh, that is fascinating to look at, if you have a look at that little, little piece there, just, oh, I'm losing all my, my toys to this wind. Okay, <laughs> so these two are from the same species, and okay, we, we're done with the dung beetles and the millipedes, so if they get lost, it's not too much of a problem. Okay, oh no, I've lost the main part, come back here. Okay, let's try stuff. So, there we go, that and that are from the same species as are these are from a different species of the same family. Now, this, I think, actually goes together. So this is from Epistothalamus glabrophons, the shiny burrowing scorpion. So that is the main part of the body, and that is one of the arms that holds the pedipulps, or pincers. Now, oh, my scorpion's a bit rusty. Now, this is from um, the bark scorpion, and that is one part of his claw. And I'm going to try see if I can. So I found them in separate. It could be from two different ones, but I was hoping it is from the same one. Oh, there we go. So it does fit in. Sorry, my fat fingers are not ideal for this. But you can see there, there's a gripping part of the scorpion's uh, pincers. And you can see pretty much the same principle as our jaw. So if we have a look there, you can see the bottom is completely stable, and we're in the opposite with our jaws at the top. So only one of the pincers actually moves. So this one will do the crushing like that uh, and catching of things, where that one will be stationary. So all the tendons and ligaments and muscles are attached only to one section of the pincers. 
So this is one of those dark little scorpions. I've, oh, the name has just departed my, my, imp, my very empty brain, but uh, it is one of the, the bark scorpions, the very dark ones. We have seen them on the, on, on the bushwalk before. I remember finding one a few times, but look, very interesting. You can see all the different things that a civet eats. And look at that, the wind does the job of cleaning my dash for me. So let's continue on. So we're gonna continue to check. I'm now convinced the Karula is inside this block. I have covered the southern boundary with a magnifying glass and I cannot find a track coming out. So I'm convinced she's in here. She's not in the little uh, creek system. I found one track coming out. So what I am hoping is that maybe she's got a kill in one of these bigger trees here. So Viam and I are gonna continue to check while we do that. I know you're going to absolutely enjoy your time with Jamie and the Masters of Dung. I've also checked the roads all around that southern boundary, so I think between the two of us, one of us would have spotted her tracks coming out. We're still with our entrancing sighting. I'll just let the Franklins finish their conversation. Now that sort of call is a contact call between the different Franklins. It's basically them announcing their presence to the rest of the Franklin world, so to speak. It's like them saying hello and good morning. And it's a little bit later this morning just because it's been a cold and windy and cloudy start. So the dawn chorus has been delayed ever so slightly. While you were with Brent, we progressed probably another about quarter inch, roughly slowly disappearing the dung walls almost become indistinguishable from the soil around it there he goes working away industriously can you imagine the strength that he must have he's now about three inches underneath the ground and he's forcing soil up above the surface now this particular species of dung beetle and the female is very busy up i think she's prepping for egg laying this particular species of dung beetle, Zumi Jody was wondering how many eggs will she lay in this dung ball? And the answer is not that many. So they're not like other insect species that reproduce with huge numbers. They put this amount of effort in because it increases the survival rate of their offspring. And therefore they can lay, whether it be sort of between one and three eggs, it'll probably in this, because of the size of this, wow, look at that. That is sheer strength. Just imagine what the equivalent would have to be for a human. It's like us going a meter, digging a meter underground and then pushing the soil up rather than digging it up, pushing it up. He's almost managed it. He's almost completely put it under the ground. So she will, Sumi Jody, she will probably only lay about one egg, I would suggest, because that larvae needs all the help he can get or all the access to food that it can get in that dung ball. The larger the species of dung beetle, the smaller their clutch size. The Safari Dean has said, because I said it would be terribly tragic if another male snuck in now and mated with her. Safari Dean said it would be even more tragic if a bird were to come in and snatch up the female and disappear with her while the male was underground digging the dung ball away. Well, at least we can comfort ourselves in the, our presence here and observing this very intricate act that is part of the dung beetle. Wow, look at that. That's incredible. I cannot believe how much dirt he can shift. What? she does that's exactly what it looks like she's doing it looks like she's coating dirt around the side of the dung beetle that's what she's the dung ball sorry that's what she's doing she's packing it around so that it forms almost like a clay like seal and simon has suggested that she might be loosening the soil around the edges in order to make it easier for the offspring to emerge. Simon, I don't think so. 
And I think she's doing the opposite. I think she's packing it around the edge because when you do find dung balls that have been broken off, broken into, they have a really significant layer of soil around them. And I would suggest that they're capable of packing it together to the point that it almost forms a, and hardens to form a cement-like substance. And in fact, I wonder if she hasn't already laid her eggs at some point during that process of him rolling her along the ground. The ability to multitask in that case would be very impressive. But it makes more sense because those dung beetles are only going to come out, or the, the, the larvae are only going to emerge in the next, next year, during the next rainy season. So they've got a couple of months still to go. So any loosening of the soil she would do would have long ago been undone by the actions of other animals. And she probably wants it as compact as possible to hide the scent of her dung beetle larvae in there. So she isn't just lazily sitting, letting the dung, the male dung beetle do all the work. She also has a bit of a role to play, admittedly not quite as strenuous as his. This is so fascinating to witness. Now there's different species, as I said, there's different species of dung beetles. Some utilize this method. Others will sit right in the middle of the pile of dung itself and dig straight down below the dung rather than forming it into a ball and carrying it off. They will then just dig down, lay their eggs and sort of compact that tunnel underneath the dung with dung around their larvae or around their eggs. This is a very interesting approach. I think that's what she's doing. She's compacting it around there. We discussed the effectiveness of the way in which he was digging. And Ganiac has suggested that this is the most effective way to do it because he's simultaneously digging and put sort of burying the dung ball at the same time. It's a very, very valid point. I mean, that dung ball in the time that we've been here has all but disappeared. This has been so interesting to witness. Maybe Ganiac it is, you know, to be completely honest, who am I to argue with the method with which a dung beetle approaches this particular process? I've always found it very strange that male dung beetles walk on their front legs and push with their back legs so that they have to keep stopping and putting their heads up over the dung balls in order to see where they're going. I've never understood why exactly it is that they've evolved that way. Clearly it's within their body structure that their front legs are nice and strong. Maybe it leaves them with their front legs free to defend the dung ball. I don't know, either way, I've always found that an interesting aspect of the way in which they've evolved. And I mean, she's nearly done now. She's actually moved away, I think she's actually moved away from the dung ball now. I want to see if she's going to, at some point, abandon him to this. Or, no, she's going back on again. Marilyn, that is absolutely fascinating. Marilyn has observed something that I haven't been watching, but now in hindsight is absolutely the case. Marilyn's observed that the dung beetle has dug in a clockwise direction, going round and round, removing the dirt that way. How interesting is that? I wonder if all dung, dung beetles dig in a clockwise direction, they probably all have a consistent rotation, but do they all do it clockwise or do some do it anti-clockwise? Do the rebels do it anti-clockwise? There he goes. It's, Marilyn, you're exactly right. Well done. That's an incredible observation. It's exactly what he's done. I would never in a million years have guessed, that, have guessed at that. What is she doing? She's doing something. She gathering more dirt to put to sort of layer on top of it. You're right. She is also moving in a clockwise direction. 
can see how built for that design she is. Just bear with me a second. I want to just check something. I've had this dung, dead dung beetle in my car for quite an extended period of time. And I've just been trying to see if it's the same species. It's not quite. But I'm just looking at the way in which that shovel-nosed face would be, oopsie, would be adapted for this whole process that we've witnessed. Certainly those grips along the front, powerful front legs, definitely would be of huge assistance. But now I'm, I understand better the shape to the face that this dung beetle has. Almost, but not quite, our dung beetle species that we're watching now. Interesting. Such incredibly powerful front limbs and rear limbs. We chatted a lot about this the other day. I keep forgetting to return this particular dead dung beetle to the earth. It's stuck in, been stuck in the vehicle for a while hinged almost like our, the way in which we design robots, the way we understand robots and limbs. That's the way these limbs work. But imagine the range of motion they need to have to be able to poise that soil up. I'm more fascinated by dung, and I've always been fascinated by dung beetles. Having witnessed that, I'm more impressed by them is maybe a better way of, of mentioning this or describing the way that I feel about them. This has been a truly fascinating experience. She's still busy. She has not abandoned him yet. She's shoveling with her head. She's actually pushing. She stopped pulling dirt over the top and she started pushing some of it away. So she is, in the way that Simon was sort of suggesting, she is now moving the bits away from the edges. She's no longer been compacting the dirt on top of the dung wall. She's now pushing it away, shoveling it away. Oh, there goes the male again. Big push. He's incredible. I would love to know the amount of weight that he's pushing up over his back. Is she going to shovel some more? <laughs> Chatting a bit about Marilyn's comment about the fact that they've gone, or the males dug clockwise, of course suggested maybe the dung beetles in Australia go counterclockwise. <laughs> I think that's very funny. Now she's going right underneath. She is. There she goes. She's going to go down. Is she going to go down to join him? Are they going to mate there? And then is she going to lay her eggs down there? I have absolutely no idea. Well, our dung beetle action's nearly over, and there's some elephants drinking at a waterhole. So here we go. We've got some great grey beasts, a really nice big breeding herd. And they've just started drinking. Nice cool weather for them. This particular group seems nice and relaxed. Just watch that bull outside of you, behind you. Just looks a little bit full of nonsense. He might be in must. It's not the naughty boy, though. So if we sit nice and quietly, they might engulf us. And wouldn't that be wonderful? We did have a wonderful elephant sighting on the sunset safari yesterday. And always wonderful. To to spend time with Ellie's again. And I'm just, sorry, just checking behind me. And it is amazing. You learn about elephants every time you see them. There might be some little nuance in the body language that you pick up that you might not have seen before. And if you have, you might not have noticed it before. You have to be 
particularly careful in this windy weather. But so far, their body language is looking great. We might get some fun from these three little trouble, four or five little troublemakers that are heading straight towards us. Hello, little nonsenses. Look at this, isn't this amazing? So the little ones are so curious. And look how many youngsters there are here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, there's a little one right in the middle. Oh, and a big female coming now. You can see very nice, relaxed body language. Look how she's opened her ears like that. Isn't this special? They are looking like they're going to engulf us. Liam, look, the little one's having a drink. Here we go. Look at that. So there's Ellie's now behind us, to the left of us. This is very special. And you can see, there we go. Here comes nonsense. And it is amazing. You can see. We always watch the adults' body language, not the little ones. The little ones might make some noise and charge the vehicles. But if we look at her, you can just see she's really nice and relaxed. And it is nice to find a herd like this, especially in this strong wind. And there's some feeding to the right. Then in front of us. Sorry, they just moved so the little one's got a gap. It's going to drink less than five feet from us. Isn't this absolutely special? Yeah. Oh, yes. Look at that. So, probably close on a year, judging from the size. Oh, drank the milk a little bit too quickly there. Had to have a little cough. little chap. So we actually physically can't move. There's elephant directly behind us, to the right, to the left, and directly in front of us. And there's no spot I would rather be than sitting in the middle of this herd. Look at those wonderful eyelashes. Uh, those long early eyelashes are there for a reason, just to protect uh, their eyes when they put their heads deep into thickets. Look, she's got some grass. Now, sniffing at a spike thorn. There we go. Down the gullet it goes. So look at that. There's a, just to let you know, there is an Ellie to, passing directly behind them. And there's another little one. It almost looks like he's stalking us from behind. Unfortunately, you can't see it, but just enjoy the ones in front of us. If I am mentioning elephants you can't see, guys, it is for the virtual reality rig. Oh, look down underneath. <laughs> it's got an itchy, itchy nose. It could even be a little bit of teething that's causing him to push his mouth into the ground like that. Yeah, some big grey bottoms. Yes, mister. I'm just going to pop the little beeper so for the virtual reality. Switch it on. I'll switch it on. It's not working again. So I'm just going to have to click my fingers quickly as those Ellie's walk away. So we've got something for the virtual reality to sync the audio with. Is that enough, Em? No, I think you need to do that. Is that OK? There we go. So in so many access, do I understand how incredibly lucky I am to spend the time with these amazing animals? That I do. And every time I see elephants, I am overjoyed. 
and having sightings like that is incredibly special. Uh, I'm going to move backwards a little bit, see if we can get back into the herd. So, ooh, very important. You'll notice I let my engine run for a few seconds before moving. And that's just to make sure that the Ellie's know that I'm not up to any mischief. So we've got some little ones behind us. And I'm just going to swing. Let's just make sure we don't surprise one around the corner. Hello, Mama. Okay, so directly behind us, this is as far as we can go, there's another elephant behind us. Um, then we'll try to show you now. There we go. So that big female, she's got a very ripped ear. We have seen her a few times before. There we go. Lots of them. And after they've had a drink now, it looks like they're going to spread out. And it's not uncommon to find a big herd of Ellie's like this covering a distance of about half a kilometer, sometimes quite far from each other. And then a little one there, a little female, and disappearing behind a little bush willow that a bigger elephants have pushed over. Okay, so I think they're going to be heading slowly towards the Mawati. I'm going to see, oh, there I'm on the right. We've got some little youngsters, just around eight, nine years old, feeding there. Very special elephant herds, and it is incredible. We do have such fantastic elephant sightings here. But as I always say, you've got to be careful. We do get elephants that come in from the western edge of Kruger. And always important to watch the body language before you get too close. Otherwise, you could get, find yourself in a compromising position. So Anne-Marie says, isn't that amazing? That mother elephant was so at ease letting the tiny calf nurse next to the vehicle. Well, Anne-Marie, uh, with with most animals, if you drive respectfully around them and you don't give them any reason to be upset with you, they'll give you the opportunity to get close. So I'm going to move now and see if we can catch up with them again in the Mawati riverbed. We saw that little calf nursing, and Megan would like to know how long do they nurse for? So, oh, there we go. They nursed to just over two years, uh, sometimes a bit longer. It all just depends on the individual. Look at this. Look, he's got a stick in his mouth. Oh, playing with it more than eating it. You got a little fight, that one. It's okay. Oh, look at that. Reaching up, feeding off the buffalo thorn. Now, those trees are also known in Afrikaans as a wakabiki bos. And what that means is a wait a bit tree. So they've got a straight thorn and a hooked thorn. And if you do get stuck in one, it takes quite a while to remove yourself from it. Hence the name wait a bit tree. But you can see those sharp thorns do nothing uh, to an elephant's mouth. And it's one of the, the elephant's favorite tree species to feed on. 
specifically uh, during the dry season. It's one of our, our evergreens and provides very important food for not only the elephants, but also kudu, inyala, bushbuck, and impala. Wind has just suddenly picked up immensely. Oh, look at that tiny little guy. There, off he goes. So it's lovely to see relaxed elephants. Oh, there's a bit of a game, game going on behind that bottom. Just reverse it. Oh no, they're going to come out all by themselves. <laughs> there we go, three different bottoms in a row. So Linda is wondering, do elephants allo suckle? So for those of you not sure what allo suckling is, it's when they will let a, non, a calf that's not theirs suckle off them. Hello, mister. He's got a thorn stuck to his nose. There we go, now you got it. Uh-uh. You, my friend, are a little bit close. There we go. So often just a little tap on the side of the vehicle will stop them developing bad habits. Oh, look at these two little boys. Having a little bit of a pushing match up there. So this was a, that guy who came very close to us was a young bull. And he was getting very, very close. Oh, he's got a sore leg. Look at that. And we saw a small injury in his nose, but the leg looks much worse. See how he's back right. Doesn't look very good. He's keeping it very straight, not bending it at all. Probably hurt himself play fighting with other bulls of his similar edge, like those two were doing up on top. There we go. Oh, it looks like the one on top is thinking about a charge down the bank. Now that's a bit of serious playing going on. <laughs> that was very funny. Uh, circus elephants. And but no, she looks like she might do it again. But she didn't put too much weight. It looked like she carried a lot of the weight on her back legs rather than on the little guy. Let's have a sit, sit down. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, boof. <laughs> so, isn't that wonderful? You do see younger elephants doing this type of stuff. Um, as they're older, with that big weight, it's very difficult to get up. But I'm just having a bit of fun. And you can see, even at that young age, they've still got to roll and uh, to get themselves back upright. It just left, looks like that little lady is having a whale of a time. You can see how she chose a spot with a slight embankment that might make it easier for her to get up. Here we go. <laughs> that was wonderful. So the main body of the herd is disappearing, but we've still got these young boys. These guys look like they're probably around 20-ish, hanging on the peripheries. See, and that's why. You can see them poking each other with the tusks there. There's the guy with a stiff leg walking off.
I love boys. Shame. You can't go and play with everyone else just because you're too boisterous. So far too many hormones flowing through them. So they can get a little bit difficult. And that's why the females generally prefer them to be on the edge of the herds and not in the middle. Here we go. Just like that. Listen to that ivory clash. Now in big elephant bulls, when you often see a broken tusk, it is from clashes like this. At this age, <coughs> it's, oh, excuse me. it's not so serious, it's more play fighting. But of course, as they get older and they have to fight for breeding rights, that's a lot more serious. So we're gonna move around to see if we can catch up with the rest of the herd on the open side. And while we do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Sounds like a magical elephant sighting. In the meantime, we have left our dung beetle pair to their business. Both of them disappeared off underground to do whatever it is dung beetles do underground whilst attempting to produce and lay offspring in their dung wall. They're still digging frantically when we left them. She'd, he'd only really managed to get the dung ball about that far underneath the surface of the ground. So I think still a little bit of work to be done before both of them can relax for the rest of their day. It is the most fascinating sighting and sitting and watching something like that is so important because you learn from start to finish exactly how that whole process will play out in the future. And now if I ever see that track or freshly dug earth that looks like that, I'll be able to tell you that it was a dung beetle digging down a dung wall. Oh, back to Brent, whose ellies are being exciting. So, these any bulls are starting to get a little bit more serious in their pushing and shoving. So we're just going to stand by here. They might... Oh, there's a tusk in the bottom. Now, this is just playing, and you, if they do, do have a little bit of serious playing, you'll see the immense power that these animals possess. Oh, he tried to do a sneak attack. <laughs> but he was, look at that. Listen to that ivory clashing. Now, quite often in these games, when one is the obvious loser, the third sometimes charges in from behind on a sneak attack. Ooh. Dancing on the precipice. There's a big drop there, boys. Say when we have. So you can see they're on top of quite a high bank. It would be quite amusing if one happened to stand a little bit too close to the edge. And the, the, the bank collapsed. So still not very serious. Still more playful than professional. Third bull gonna sneak up from behind. He has come closer. Siberia Zumi says, am I sure these ellies haven't got in to some fermented marula fruit? Well, Siberia, firstly, it would take marula fruit to do that. We've had almost none this year because of the dry conditions early on. Secondly, elephants cannot, oh, here comes the sneak. Tusk in the bottom. Oh, nearly. Uh, elephants cannot get drunk on fermented marula fruit. That was a, a rumor started by a movie made in the 70s, if I remember correctly, called Beautiful People. 
by a South African filmmaker by the name of Jamie Ace. And uh, that, I think that movie did quite well internationally. And what actually happened is that those elephants that looked like they were drunk were actually drugged. Um, they were part of a capture thing, so when elephants are under sedation for movement, they do look like they are possibly drunk. And that was how it happened. And the baboons that got drunk were actually the <laughs> feeding off spiked marula fruit. Obviously, oh, uh, things have changed a bit since then. Uh, you wouldn't be able to uh, do that anymore. But there was a, I think it was Harvard or Yale, I can't remember exactly who did a study on elephants getting drunk on marula fruit. But let's just, I'll discuss that now. Let's just watch these boys. All three of them there now. Hang on. Jamie, you can go past me, see if you can catch up with the rest of the breeding herd around Chilipan. So Jamie's are coming past. We're going to stay with these boys, and Jamie is going to go see if she can find the rest of the herd. So it looks like the, there goes Jamie and jean -Dre. So it looks like the majority of the boxing is over. They've split up a little bit and started feeding. And the others are moving through. So I think Jamie is probably going to be in the best position to get a view of them if they do pop out on the other side of these thickets. driving directly behind her because it's the only route out of here. And as soon as Jamie gets a view, we will jump across. So let's jump on with Jamie and see if she finds the elephants first. Let us see what we can find and whether or not this elephant herd has popped out where Brent has suggested that they might. Lots of tracks going back the other way. But it seems as though most of the herd went across towards the Chelepan. This is almost like the Great Lakes district of Juma. Perhaps a slight exaggeration, but there's so many pans and muddy holes around this particular block. The Great Puddles district is maybe a better, a better description. Lots of tracks coming back down this way. I'll just check a little bit further ahead in the road, see if they're around there. There you go, there's another great puddle, the puddle district. We've been, Brent's been with these. Sorry, hold on one second. Brent's just chatting to me. He's saying they've come out closer towards Chele Pan. Um, so we've been watching those elephants, those young bulls, clash with Brent. We know that the tusks are extended teeth. Hello, everybody. We know that the tusks are the equivalent of an incisor tooth, I'm oh, sorry, a canine tooth. And yes, Tammy, if an elephant breaks its tusk, it would be incredibly painful, as painful as it would be for us to chip or to break a tooth. Hello, gorgeous girls. This is such a beautiful setting. And I find a nice spot so we can watch them. There's a little one drinking. And Tammy, a lot of 
aggressive elephant incidents. Now, they're fairly few and far between, but very often an elephant has been found to be exceptionally aggressive only because it's discovered afterwards that it has an abscess in the base of its tusk. So if they crack or break a tusk, it immediately opens the possibility up for infection. And those big pus-filled abscesses that form on people can form on elephants too, and it's exceptionally painful. Are you having fun there? This is such a beautiful setting. The first time I've ever seen this pan with water, proper water. All the Franklins want to do this morning is interrupt my sentences. Perhaps they're trying to tell me something. Perhaps we should just enjoy this sighting in silence for a bit. Enjoying the long grasses around the edge of the pan. So, Linda, Brent, sorry, you didn't have a chance to fully finish the answer to your question about elephants' aloe suckling. Now, Linda, elephants are so fascinating in this respect because, no, they won't. They won't aloe suckle each other's youngsters, but they will do what is known as aloe mothering. I just want to have a look at that bird that is, sorry, give me one second, I just want to grab binoculars. I've also been distracted. Poor Linda. Every time one of us tries to answer a question, we get distracted by something else. Sorry, Linda. I promise I'll be back with you. So whilst they will not feed a calf that is not there, again, that's a general description of elephant behavior. Can I say for with 100% certainty that it has never happened ever before in the world? No, I can't. There is the possibility that maybe a mother might allow another calf to suckle, but generally, no, they do not allow suckle. I've never seen it happen. I don't know of anyone who has ever witnessed such behavior. But they do do what's known as allo mothering, particularly the young female elephants of around, sort of from about six years old on, once new calves are born, whether it's a sibling or a younger cousin, they will spend a lot of time practicing their mothering skills on them. So they'll look after the little ones, and we've seen that multiple times on these live safaris where a a younger elephant will run up and keep the calf in check, maybe encourage it to play or play with it, or wrap her trunk around its head and cuddle it. Uh, they, whilst they allo mother, and they allo mother very fiercely, they do not allo suckle each other's babies. And the, in that way, they also enforce the bonds between different members of the herds, and that's essential. That's why anywhere that you find a closed system with a contraception program for the elephants, so in other words, a reserve that has to control its elephant numbers because having too many of them in a small closed off area is not a good thing. But you'll find that any reserve that does implement process or a practice of contracepting their elephants will never ever contracept every single member of the herd. So they'll never deny the young females the chance to have offspring initially because they're so important. Her tusks, this particular female's tusks are particularly sharp, they're almost like spears. As we sit and enjoy a really peaceful elephant sighting around this lovely setting, Siberia Zoomies been looking closely underneath the elephant's chin or around underneath their trunk and has remarked, he's remarked upon a number of hairs that are around the elephant's lower lip. Now they're essentially whiskers in a way. So an elephant needs them there because they have a complete blind spot around the front of their trunk and then obviously underneath their head. They cannot drop their head so that they can see there. So those extra tufts of hair, the almost beard-like growth, is a way of providing extra sensory perception around their mouths. So when they're learning to use their trunks and coordinate that process of putting trunk to mouth, as this little Ellie's doing with water, 
<laughs> Little fountain. He's just having fun as well. very entertaining to watch. So Siberia Zuvi, especially when sticking your mouth straight towards a tree full of thorns, it helps to help them to coordinate it. So for, James Richard, you've said you can't begin to imagine what it feels like to be surrounded by a herd of elephants and that it is definitely on your bucket list. It's one of my favorite experiences in the whole wide world. Fortunately, it's something that I get to experience on a regular basis. There's a beauty and a peace to it, edged with an awareness of just how much bigger they are than you. And just how fortunate we are that, we, that they allow us to have experiences like this. To be surrounded by these curious creatures, so unique out here, yet with such a sentient capacity to the way in which they act around each other and around with us. There's no other animal out here that interacts with us on the level that elephants do. Whether it be the young calves entertaining themselves by trying to scare us, or the females communicating their boundaries and their protectiveness of their herd with very, very clear signals. And I would say that there is no other animal that we are able to communicate with as well as we are, or at least that is able to communicate with us as well as elephants are in this particular context. They tell us everything we need to know about the way that they're feeling. Linda's also loving this elephant sighting as well as the long eyelashes of the little elephants. Hello mischief. Hello. Oh, you're being guided by mom. She's going to come right up underneath this tree where the long grass is. Now, Linda, I also really, really love long, the long eyelashes of the elephants. They definitely have an impressive set. I think even with false eyelashes, none of us would be quite able to reach the level that they do. Hello, good girl. Okay. Trying to get hold of that tree and it keeps blowing away from you. Yes, gorgeous. Those long eyelashes serving exactly a perfect example of what they do. Thank you very much, girl. That's exactly what I was about to talk about. Protecting the eye when faced with thorn trees like this buffalo thorn. Now we're coming to the end of our sunrise safari, so I'm going to say a big thank you both on my behalf and on Brent's behalf as well to our wonderful cameraman, Jean Dre, on my vehicle and Viam on my vehicle. And we're going to be starting our sunset safari five minutes earlier this afternoon due to having another school class on board with us once again. Definitely a really exciting opportunity. Thank you to Louise and Jerry in final control for all of their work. And most importantly, thank you for joining us on this wonderful windy morning out on Juma. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world and we'll catch up with you in a couple of hours. Cheers.